This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 15, recorded on September 2nd, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Welcome back, Vincent. Hope you had a great vacation. Thank you. It was terrific. Europe is a wonderful place. And I'd just like to say Stanley was a, a great substitute, but he was still a substitute. I think he did a great job. I th- yeah, I, thought I do They too. were all good. I listened to both of them. Good science and, and good episodes. So I thank you all for, for carrying along while I was cavorting around. Also joining us today from Yale University, Joe Handelsman. Hi, Vincent. Good to hear you again. You too. It's been a long time since we were on together, actually, right? Yeah, that's right, because you were in Europe the last time I was on. That's right. So we have all gone through a hurricane, an earthquake. Did you feel the earthquake up there in New Haven? Oh, yeah. We had earth, wind, and fire all in one week. It was exciting. <laughs> but uh, We my... had the same. We had the same. We felt the earthquake here. The building yeah. shook a little. Yeah. Yeah, it's really something. Something else has happened this year. We're really in the apocalypse, I think. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I'm waiting for the frogs and, and, and the boils to come. <laughs> <laughs> We've already got the plagues, right? <laughs> it's right. That's right. That's right. Well, Alio is on vacation today, so it is the three of us to talk about microbiology. So let's do that. And the first story I wanted to talk about uh, is a paper based on a paper in PLOS Biology, It came out very recently. It's called How Many Species Are There on Earth and in the Ocean? And it was also covered in the Washington Post on the front page, an article called 8.7 Million Species Exist on Earth Study Estimates. And this raised the hackles (laughs) of microbiologists everywhere. (laughs) And Joe. (laughs) As well it should have. (laughs) Tell us about it, Joe. Well, in this article, they uh, develop a a mathematical approach to extrapolate the number of species on Earth from the ones that we know. And they predict that there are over 8.7 million species on Earth and make a lot of good arguments about the estimates for particularly animals and plants. But when they get to the microbes, the results are absolutely I don't know any other word but ridiculous. They predict that among the prokaryotes, there would only be one species of archaea in the oceans. And I think there's something got to be wrong with the model when it doesn't even predict what we already know. And we certainly know that there are more than one species of archaea in the oceans. And the total number of bacteria on Earth, they predict, is around 10,000. And again, We've already cataloged fairly close to that, and the estimates for most um, microbiological environments are well over 10,000, more like 10 million, some people argue 100 million species of bacteria. So the, the estimates just don't make sense for the microbes, and although they admit that their, their calculations are less robust in the microbial world than in the eukaryotic world, it does kind of make you doubt the entire calculation if they're so way off, so many orders of magnitude with the microbes. Mm. And so there's been all this furor now in the newspapers and letters from uh, past and current presidents of the American Society for Microbiology and all sorts of statements because the microbiologists feel that the microbes have simply been rebuffed by this calculation. (laughs) And in fact, I think I heard Ed DeLong and Norm Pace both exclaiming what here in South Carolina, even though Norm is in Colorado and Ed is in uh, Boston. Yes, it resounded from coast to coast. (laughs) So it makes you suspect that the authors of this study weren't aware of current estimates of bacterial diversity, right? Yeah, because I think anybody who knows 
what's been going on for the last two decades in microbial diversity would just question the basic calculations if they saw numbers like that. Right, right. There was a, uh, there's been a good blog post on this by Jonathan Eisen, and he said, you know, you have to question, as you said, their basic methods when they get the bacteria so far off. And uh, Carl Zimmer wrote a piece in the Times, and he questioned the whole thing. He, he talked to some people who said, ah, it's probably all wrong. So I wonder if the reviewers even of this paper were aware of the diversity that they're missing. It's really puzzling. Well, and, and I think it, it calls a, a much larger issue into question, and that is why are so many biologists generally unaware of the diversity of microbial life? Uh, I've found that, you know, like these authors, many people wouldn't be surprised by the calculations they came up with. 10,000 species of bacteria, sure, that sounds reasonable to most uh, zoologists on Earth or plant biologists. And th I think there's something wrong with the way microbiologists are educating the rest of the world that those numbers didn't just scream out at the authors, the reviewers, the editors, or anyone else who looked at this paper. Yeah. I think one way you could almost get to that same conclusion that they're the, the way they perform the analysis was wrong is if you ask the question, are there at least 10,000 unique niches on the planet? And we certainly know that there are more than 10,000 unique niches, and at least every niche that I know of has at least one bacterial species in it. And so even, you know, a, a quick and dirty gut check on the part of the authors should have, you know, given them some inkling that maybe their methods were a bit flawed when it came down to uh, the microbes. Yeah. One of my graduate students had a great way of looking at it. She said that um, she, she was both an entomologist and a microbiologist, and she said, well, everyone accepts that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of species of insects. But from our work and the work of many others, essentially every species of insect has a unique species of bacterium in it. Mm. So there are at least as many species of bacteria as there are insects. And that at least gives you a, a you know, bottom line mm. calculation. There's a quote by an entomologist in the Post article. And that entomologist says, insects account for 85% of life on Earth. So why would anyone bother counting species of any other organism. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an entomologist who doesn't know this. It's yep. incredible. So you're right, Joe, it's probably all communication. And you know, when the microbiologists get together, we don't talk about this because we all know how many species there are, but we should talk about it more. Well, even the entomologists should know certainly how a termite makes its living. And the termite would not be able to make its living unless it had archaea as well as bacteria. Yep. And, you know, there's, there's certainly more than one archaea and one bacteria in, in a termite's gut because the, termite, the gut of the termite is at least as complicated as the, as the many stomachs of cows. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, we worry about the termites making all that methane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is unfortunate, but there it is. And uh, David Huber and Bonnie Bassler have a, a letter in the Post. I guess it was published yesterday. But they really wanted to have an op-ed piece, a longer piece, which would have been more visible. Because, I, I, you know, the original Post article was on the front page and the letter is not going to be read by nearly as many people. Um, but it's better than nothing, I suppose. Yeah. That's our job to um, to rebut it and spread the word as widely as we can, right? Right. That's right. So we'll put links to all these stories in the show notes, and uh, we've done our part here. Okay. let's. Uh, we have two uh, papers to talk about today. Uh, but before I get to them, we do have a sponsor for today's episode. This week in Microbiology Today is brought to you by Wiley Blackwell, the leading scientific publisher of books, scholarly journals, major reference works, and databases. This month, 
It's September 2011. They're offering 25% off all microbiology and virology books in their catalog. And you can see their catalog at wiley.com slash go slash microworld, all one word. It's wiley.com slash go slash microworld. And if you like microbes, which many of our listeners obviously do, you'll find a lot to like here. There's a book on bacterial signaling. There's a book on bacterial virulence by Philippe Sansonetti. Uh, there's one on bacillus anthracis and anthrax and many other good ones as well. So check that out, 25% off. If you're on Facebook, they have a page there as well, facebook.com slash microbiology news. And we thank Wiley Blackwell for their support of TWIM. So the first paper, which was actually suggested to us by Thomas, who is a TWIV listener, uh, is about the 2010 Haitian cholera outbreak. Did it originate in Nepal? So what do you think of this, Michael? I thought this was an absolutely fascinating paper, the, the way they, they crafted the story. Um, I'd like to give the listeners a little historical background of, of how cholera has moved around the planet. Um, the first epidemic that we appreciated as sentient beings was back in 1817. And um, what happened is cholera moved in the bilge water of ships of Britain. And uh, the ships of Britain acquired the cholera bacillus from uh, the Bay of Bengal. And then those ships dumped their ballast or their bilge water in the home ports. And from the home ports of Europe, uh, it moved in into Russia. And as any student of epidemiology knows, uh, this is sort of the beginning of modern epidemiology with John Snow and his famous pump. Back in um, 1855, uh, there was a, another cholera epidemic that raged through London. Thousands of individuals were, were extremely ill and died. And John Snow did all the shoe leather epidemiology asking the question, where did this contagion come from. This was well before Pasteur, so we didn't know about bacteria, and he figured it out that it was a, a pump. And today you can go to this a pub that is erected in the general vicinity of this, this famous pub in which uh, cholera was actually transmitted to Greater London in 1855. And since that time, there have been seven global pandemics of cholera that have gone around the globe. The last one occurring between 1961 and 1971, which brought us the El Tor strain uh, across the planet. And cholera is a, a rather interesting gram-negative microbe. The first thing that I always found interesting about um, this microbe is that it has two chromosomes. This is something um, very different. When I first learned microbiology, bacteria always had one unique chromosome. And today, we know that this particular microbe has two chromosomes, each one separate and distinct. And in the microbial world, a uh, chromosome is def operationally defined as those genes that are essential for the life of the of the microorganism, and it has two uh, two megabases or so chromosomes, and um, for a total genome mass of about four megabases, and there's two separate origins of replications, and um, this microbe does its uh, famous activity by the manifestation of a toxin. And this particular toxin results in the hypersecretion of chloride uh, in your small intestine. And the diarrhea is so intense that the enterocytes, the eukaryotic cells in, in the uh, small intestine, become so fragile that they slough off from the basement membrane of the villus and uh, that's where the rice watery diarrhea 
uh, description comes from. It's not rice that's in the diarrhea. It's actually the debris of the enterocyte that you're actually seeing um, in that uh, diarrhea effluent. Is this a one-bucket disease, Michael? <laughs> it's a one-bucket disease, to go back to our diarrheal metaphor, but the dangerous thing here is because the cholera toxin results in the secretion of uh, chloride and sodium, what happens is you get a large amount of uh, water coming out at the same time via uh, passive uh, osmosis, and the net consequence is you rapidly dehydrate and you're losing your electrolytes, and so you effectively um, go into shock and ultimately die from all the concomitant issues associated with losing your electrolytic balance. And of course, the best therapy is um, uh, you replace those fluids. And uh, Gatorade is uh, uh, certainly uh, a balanced salt mixture that has sufficient sugar to allow you to absorb those nutrients and antibiotics in this particular case can actually alleviate the length of symptoms. Normally, if you don't have antibiotics available, this is about a five to six day course. And as you well know, if you're losing so much fluid over the five to six day period, you don't actually get to five to six days because you die from dehydration uh, before then. And so, what the authors of this paper did is they began to ask the question, where did this cholera come from? And they learned that um, this microorganism, well, well, they knew that this microorganism likes to live in um, estuaries that has about 15 parts per million sodium uh, chloride uh, in solution. And so that's a, a you know, partial freshwater, partial saltwater situation, and, which was in this particular case also linked to a, a cholera outbreak in the region of Nepal. And here's where the story becomes interesting, and here's where the authors began their shoe leather molecular epidemiology approach to solving. Um, this problem. They were very fortunate in that the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention of the United States had performed pulse field gel electrophoresis. Those of you who are familiar with electrophoresis, pulse field is no different than garden variety electrophoresis that we routinely do on nucleic acids to cut up plasmids and to verify insert size, except rather than using plasmid DNA, what they use is chromosomal DNA. So instead of having, you know, a 3,000 to 10,000 nucleotide plasmid that you cut up with restriction enzymes, you're now cutting up the four megabases of DNA associated with the chromosome. And what pulse field does is it pulses and changes the direction of the current, and it allows the DNA, which is now very, very large, to migrate into the agarose gel so you can actually see that familiar ladder that you normally see. And there's a unique pattern associated with the chromosome. And as any of you who have ever used restriction enzymes know they recognize particular sets of sequences, and should the microorganisms differ or the sequences within the microorganisms differ, you may get a different pulse pattern. So they began to characterize the strains that were in Haiti, and then they began to ask the question, were the strains from these other locales similar or different? To make the long story short, they found out that first, the pulse patterns were very similar to the Nepalese outbreak of cholera, which occurred in 2010, shortly before this outbreak made it to Haiti. And there were 1,400 cases in um, the Midwestern region of, Nef of Nepal that occurred in 
um, July of 2010, and this whole outbreak was controlled fairly quickly, and it was actually contained by um, about the middle of August. They then compared and contrasted the strains, and what they found first, they did basic bacteriology. They asked the first question, was the physiology similar? And the, the traditional way you do this is you can ask about antibiotic sensitivity and you can ask about uh, basic metabolism. And they found that the strains associated with uh, the cholera outbreak in Haiti were very similar, if not identical, to the strains that they discovered in Nepal. And uh, the pulse field pattern was similar but it wasn't um, quite exact, and so they had available to them a uh, whole genome sequencing, or as they abbreviated WGS, and they similarly had whole genome sequencing associated with an outbreak from um, Bangladesh and Mozambique, as well as uh, from Peru, because Peru is on the same is within the same hemisphere as Haiti, so they thought the usual suspects would be closer rather than from Nepal, which is in a different hemisphere. And they began to compare and contrast, and the phylogenetic patterns associated with this indicated a, a very close relationship between the Haitian and Nepalese epidemic of Vibrio cholera. They go into great detail talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, and this is where I was really impressed between the cause and effect. Was the Haitian form of cholera equivalent to the Nepalese one? And what they found from their whole genome sequencing is that there were less than 100 SNPs were identified when they compared the Haitian outbreak to the Nepalese outbreak. 100, less than 100 out of out of the total genome, which is how big? Which again? is for four million bases. Yeah. Now, spontaneous mutations in bacteria, the rule of thumb, occur one base for every million bases of DNA, and bacteria have a very um, good proofreading system. Make sure their chromosome is intact. But as good as the bacterial proofreading system is for replicating DNA spontaneous mutations occur. And so you have 4 million bases. Now ask yourself the question, how many generations have we gone through from Nepal to Haiti? And in the interim, what happened is the United Nations brought in Nepalese troops from Nepal to Haiti to help with the reconstruction and the uh, relief of the Haitians after their devastating earthquake that occurred in January of 2010. And so just thinking about a less than 100 mutations and the amount of time from uh, July of 2010 until the Haitian military showed up, uh, not the Haitian military, the Nepalese military showed up, this really is what pushed it over the edge for me, is that these single SNPs, provides such a strong argument that the source of the Haitian R outbreak was indeed from this clonal group um, that came out of Nepal through their military. Now, cholera normally is not a passenger pathogen in people. We quickly get rid of it. Um, it doesn't hang around with us. So it's... It's, is this beginning to teach us something, or do we have to take a page from Rita Caldwell and ask the question, were copepods hanging around inside some of the Nepalese soldiers? They ingested water, or was it associated with their canteens and the copepods? Again, this is a different form of, of of bilge water, but where did the cholera come from? And the life cycle of cholera is it actually lives in these marine animals, copepods, which are about three orders of magnitude larger than bacteria. And Dr. Caldwell most elegantly showed the way to protect yourself 
from a, a cholera outbreak if you don't have access to um, uh, filtration systems is you can actually use sari cloth, which is a fine um, woven fabric, and you can actually pass water through the sari cloth, which is uh, sufficient to filter out these one to three millimeter sized animals that typically contain the cholera bacillus, and you can make your water potable. And so the question is, did the Nepalese bring the water or was it inside the people hmm. that actually came to serve? And then they deposited into the water supply through the same way um, we deposit things into our sewage treatment system. So you don't think it's likely that they were asymptomatically infected, right? That's absolutely the case, Vincent. Um, Vibrio cholera can be carried in the gut of individuals exposed to cholera, and we know that cholera is endemic in Nepal. So even if the individuals were not ill, and presumably the soldiers were healthy souls, um, they could have been carrying the Vibrio cholera in their gut, and then as they showed up in Haiti, the cholera would leave the natural way and end up in the uh, distribution system, so to speak, of uh, the Haitian groundwater supply. So now the issue is how did this avirulent form of cholera that left the soldiers become virulent? And here's where the story gets a bit more complicated. Now there's some discussion as to what then triggers the toxin to go from quiescent to a virulent form inside that organism. In good old Charleston, South Carolina, we can isolate uh, the cholera bacillus off of our coast routinely, mm -hmm. but it's not producing the toxin. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, you know, what triggers the toxin production is thought to be a, a phage bloom, and the phage bloom is coordinated by this osmotic uh, trigger point that they think is is related to the monsoon season, at least in in Bangladesh. And I haven't done much reading on that in the of the last few years. I think this was work of John Michelanos and, and his group up up at Harvard. I guess that I just. I, I, this is quite clear from this wonderful analysis that these strains most likely originated in Nepal, but I, I just still don't understand how they were carried over, you know, by the workers. I mean, I, you know, the toxin idea is one scenario, but uh, how likely is that? I mean, is that something that happens? You would, you would carry a strain with a quiescent toxin, and then in another environment it becomes active? Is that the idea? It could get triggered or... Depends how the military traveled. If they brought their own water trucks with them, it could have been something as simple it was in mm. their water truck. And the authors didn't comment on yeah, not at all, right? Uh, on how they think it it got to um, Haiti. It, it just is in Haiti, yeah. and it's quite similar, if not identical, to the clone that was responsible for the Nepalese outbreak of July yeah. of 2010. I think they're very careful not to speculate about how it came from Nepal. They just stick to the science in this paper. Yeah, and it's it's probably the safe safe thing to do because um, again, the the biology of cholera is is pretty elegant and, and complicated. It it does have this um, interaction with these marine animals, the copepods, and it it could be something as simple as. You know, it's it's coming along, but we knew we do know that it it travels in bilge water, and mm -hmm. the question is, did it come? Did they did they arrive by ship? Yeah, yeah. So you can find cholera off the the coast of the U.S. routinely, or oh, just yeah. yeah, oh yeah, everywhere, all along both coasts. Uh, I don't know about the Pacific coast, but I do know that in Charleston Harbor, and it's the water temperature that protects us. Huh. That's interesting. We have all sorts of things. We got all the poisonous snakes of the United <laughs> States here. We we have hurricanes. We have earthquakes. Uh, we have fires. <laughs> they make this interesting statement in the discussion. Complete genomic analysis of pathogen populations is now a reality and is dramatically changing our approach to molecular epidemiology. 
Uh, Joe, you probably saw in the Times just Tuesday this week uh, an article on genome sequencing of bacteria and how they used it to identify uh, a bacillus infecting a, a patient from Texas. They thought it was anthrax, and it turned out to be serious, and, and they learned that from whole genome sequencing. Mm -hmm. And there was also um, a study this week that looked at the um, teeth of people who had supposedly died of the plague in, um, I think it was the 14th century, and they were able to dig out sufficient DNA to identify the organism as Yersinia pestis, which is the current modern-day plague uh, pathogen. Mm -hmm. um, and because of whole genome sequencing, they were able to essentially de develop what they called fishing lines to pull out the sequences that were typical of Yersinia pestis. Nice. And there'd been, you know, this long debate about whether it was actually Yersinia that caused the plague in those days, or maybe the Black Plague was a virus or something else. And they pretty definitively demonstrated that it was the same plague organism as we have today. So I think that the whole genome sequencing really has just radicalized the, the, the understanding of infectious disease and pr particularly this kind of forensics uh, where we re reconstruct these epidemics and try to figure out long after they occurred, um, who was causing them and where those organisms came from. Yeah, it's worth pointing out that um, this is relatively recent for bacteria, right? Just in the, in the last few years when the technology has become quicker. But for viruses, we've been doing this for a long time because, of course, viral genomes are much smaller. Yeah, you guys have been lucky. Yeah, we work on uh, organisms with small genomes. We do that on purpose, you know. And uh, you could you could sequence whole viral genomes years ago, so that's been used for example to track where polio outbreaks come from. We can tell exactly there was a polio outbreak in Nigeria a number of years ago, and we could tell it came from India because of the sequence. And it's very easy to get. It's only seven and a half uh, kb in length, so it's a, it's orders of magnitude easier. But nowadays, of course, it's all easy apparently to do these sequencing exercises. It's just amazing because I keep thinking back to sequencing polio in 1981. It took me a year <laughs> to do that as a postdoc. Well. <laughs> By myself with those big gels, and now you can do it in an hour probably for a few hundred and dollars. And you get more coverage. And you get more coverage. Back when you did polio, you probably didn't have nearly as much coverage as they had for this whole genome sequencing of an organism, um, you yeah. know, three orders of magnitude larger than what you did. Yeah. Now they have here 10x or 100x coverage. The average genome yeah. coverage for 24 isolates was greater than 100x. <laughs> I was lucky to get two or three x. You know, it was up to me how many times <laughs> I wanted to sequence it. And once I got a read, you know, it's amazing. Joe, do you do any whole genome? sequencing? We are doing some, and it is remarkable what, what we can learn from it, from the overall genome organization, you know, what genes are there, how similar a member of a species is to other members of the species, uh, the small differences and large differences that define a pathogenic organism from a non-pathogenic one, sure. right down to the kinds of these SNPs and single nucleotide changes that define particular isolates. And I, I find it just remarkable every time we look at a genome, um, what we can learn at every single level of definition. It's amazing. So, Michael, do you think one day, instead of the, the classical microbiology lab procedures that are used, you'll just do whole genome sequencing on patient samples to identify organisms? It really is going to depend on if you have a pure culture. Okay. Because as my friends in the clinical lab and our listeners in the clinical lab will tell you, it's all about that isolate mm. to, because you do have to separate it away from oftentimes the, the flora that comes along with it. Yeah, And yeah. traditionally, the clinical microbiologists do that with their elegant selective and, and differential media that are, have been, you know, designed to, to go fishing for particular pathogens based on uh, a presentation. Yeah. But I yeah. think once the database gets robust enough, we should be able to, to do that. 
And I think it'll give so much more interesting information. I think medical microbiology has been limited to some degree by we find what we look for and we do select for particular organisms on particular media and typically when a clinical lab finds a candidate pathogen that seems like the obvious answer, they stop. And often I think we're beginning to see that disease is caused by complexes of organisms and it may not be sufficient to stop when we find that first appropriate candidate and whole genome sequencing of these complex samples will begin to provide that kind of much more complex portrait of the microbiology of disease. Perhaps there will be multiple members of the same species or multiple species that are inciting the disease and the combinations of organisms organisms could be giving uh, very, very different disease symptoms as well as uh, prognosis for treatment. Mm. So sometimes you might want to sequence complex mixtures then. Very much so. One of the interesting things that's happened probably in the last five years is the ability of PCR to selectively amplify live DNA as opposed to all DNA. And the Mm -hmm. way this is accomplished is with dyes that are selectively taken up by the dead cell. The dye intercalates into the DNA, rendering it non-PCRable. And then when you bust open the cell, you get out clean DNA that enables you to amplify the live microorganism. And so you can actually select out. And this goes back to probably both stories that we've done so far is the whole issue of viable but non-culturable bacteria because oftentimes we just don't know how to grow the microorganism in order to ask whether or not it is indeed present. Mm. That's one of the, the things that I think this new PCR technology enabling you to selectively amplify live DNA as opposed to dead DNA or all DNA mm. uh, will come in handy. Nice. That's a great one. All right, let's move on to our, our second paper. This one was published in PNAS. It's called Microbiota Regulates Immune Defense Against Respiratory Tract Influenza A Virus Infection. And this is from Akiko Iwasaki's group at Yale. And you must know them, Joe. Uh, yes. Uh, when I had put this on the agenda a while ago, Alio said, oh, we have enough microbiota papers and uh it's okay okay we won't do it but i looked at it again and it's so nice we have done a few papers now on how the microbiome influences various pathological states like asthma uh colitis i think you guys did while i was gone and this one's a virus infection so i thought this was different enough and i wanted to do a virus paper anyway here on twim So this uh, is a study done in mice. You can infect mice with some strains of influenza virus. You put the virus in intranasally. uh, They develop a lung infection, uh, and you can study it very nicely. And what has been known from studying this kind of infection in mice is that immune responses to this kind of infection requires the inflammasome. And this is a complex that we've talked about before on TWIM. It is an early, it is a member of the early innate response to infection. It's a complex of, of many proteins. And it's important for the production of cytokines that then help mature the immune response and lead to good antibody and T cell production against your virus infection. So it's been known before that in mice, you need an inflammasome for good responses to flu. But how those inflammasomes get activated has not been clear. Now, in this paper, what they do is look at the involvement of the microbiome in responses to flu. They do a very simple experiment. You take mice, you treat them with antibiotics. They use a combination of vancomycin, neomycin, metronidazole, and ampicillin. You treat the the mice with with these antibiotics. This alters their, their gut microbiome. It doesn't eliminate it, it just alters it. And they look at actually the the composition of the microbiome by sequencing uh, ribosomal RNA. And then they infect these mice with 
influenza virus. And what you find, amazingly, is that the mice make far less antibodies against the virus. Uh, they make much less interferon, and they make much fewer uh, T cells, both of the CD4, the helper T cells, and the CD8, the cytotoxic T cell variety. It's just by treating them with antibiotics, now they have an impaired adaptive immune response. I thought it was really cool as to their selection of antibiotics. Yes, what do you think of that? That they used vancomycin, which is um, uh, involved in cell wall biosynthesis, but it's different than ampicillin, which is also involved in cell wall biosynthesis, but it's in the, the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan, whereas the vancomycin is in the carrying of, of the the molecules to make more cell wall. Neomycin is going after a membrane, and metronidazole's principal target is uh, DNA, but it needs to be activated by redox in terms of it accepts electrons and then it makes a toxic molecule that effectively goes off and oxidatively co um, mm -hmm. corrupts the DNA. So they got all the, the usual suspects or targets, and they also found that the choice of antibiotics mattered in the response. That's right. Yeah, later on, they do look at individual antibiotics. Uh, they treated them with these, each of these that we mentioned uh, individually. And what they conclude was that it's the gram positives uh, in the gut if depleted, uh, inhibit the antibody and, and T-cell responses. So those bacteria must be producing something that uh, stimulates the production of, of the inflammasome and therefore uh, the production of these cytokines. It's very interesting. Now this defect in these antibiotic-treated mice is not a general immune defect because they show you get immune responses to protein antigens, you can also get normal immune responses to herpes viruses or Legionella, which are pathogens that don't require the inflammasome to make a good immune response. So this defect is specific for pathogens like flu, where the inflammasome is critical for helping to mature uh, the adaptive uh, immune response. Now, the inflammasome works by uh, working through... Um, a number of uh, cytokines, and they find, in fact, that these cytokines, they're uh, IL-1 beta and IL-18, these are defective in these mice treated with uh, antibiotics. Their levels are, the levels of the messages are much lower. This whole defect caused by treatment with antibiotic can be rescued by giving the mice a, an, an innate immune agonist. So something like LPS, lipopolysaccharide, or CPG, uh, dinucleotide of DNA, poly-IC, peptidoglycan. You can give the mice uh, these products, which stimulate the innate response via toll-like receptors, and it rescues the defect caused by changing their gut flora. And the interesting thing is, you can put these agonists into the mice rectally, and it fixes the defect in the lung. So something is being made in the in the gut that can then travel to the lung and, and uh, engender an appropriate uh, antibody response. So if we don't have the right flora, Vincent, do yep. you foresee in the near term where the big pharma is going to develop a suppository for people that we could take during flu season Absolutely. that may help <laughs> us get over it? It's just what they say at the end of the paper. I know. I, I was like... Yeah. My goodness, uh, suppository Probiotic therapy during the flu season, exactly. Well, it might be as simple as just eating, right? Um, well, there yeah, was, but... There's an interesting study that showed that people in surgery recovery um, apparently get fewer infections if they're fed by feeding tubes than if they're fed IV, suggesting that they have a, a better immune response if the bacteria in their guts are being fed while they're in recovery. Mm, yeah, sure. So it could be the same thing, and, and they're particularly protected from lung infections, mm. which is, I think, similar here that the IgA response is shared between the lung and the gut, and uh, there's probably a very rapid communication between what the bacteria in the gut are inciting and the response in right. the lung. 
So, you know, people who have flu-like symptoms, they go to a physician, they, they're given antibiotics. That's probably not the right thing to do, not just because you don't have a bacterial infection, but you're changing your gut flora, and maybe that makes the influenza infection even worse. And it may last longer. Exactly, I mean, exactly. It, it, it was an absolutely fascinating concept. And it was interesting that they chose Legionella pneumophila, which is, you know, one of these delightful, again, facultative intracellular um, parasites. It, it likes to live inside cells. And Legionella is one of these um, microbes that actually has uh, an animal cell that it lives in and the natural environment. It's mm. it's almost very similar to a copepod. Hmm. So interesting. So there's one more one more point I want to make before we finish up on this one. And that is when so when you get infected, say with influenza virus, one of the first things that happened is that the dendritic cells which patrol your tissues, they're in the lung, they sense that there is virus present. And they take bits of that virus and they go back to the lymph nodes and they present the protein, the viral protein, to T cells. And they say, hey, something's going on here. And the T cells say, okay. And they get activated, they multiply, and they go to the lung and they try and clear the infection. So in the antibiotic-treated mice, the defect is that the dendritic cells don't migrate to the lymph nodes, probably because they don't have the right cytokines to mature them to be able to do that. And so it's amazing that the defect, having not, not having the right bacteria in your gut, prevents the production of some cytokine that's needed to push the inflammasome response forward so that the dendritic cells mature and they can do their job. I mean, this is just an amazing communication between two organ systems, the gut yeah. and the lung. So the next question is, do you think something like this, if you don't have the right flora, could be applied to cancer, where if, if you don't have the right type of flora, you're going to have trouble clearing um, cancers as they, as they develop? Could cancer be something as simple as not having the right commensals in the right concentrations to produce um, these things? Because in reality, cancer is a a much smaller insult in the beginning before it really gets out of hand? Or do you think cancer's got too much of self involved? I think it's a good idea. I think it, I mean, there's probably no one answer, right, for cancers, but I'll bet that contributes to some because, as you know, immune surveillance detects cancer cells early on, and, and a defect in that process allows them to multiply, in some cases anyway. So you, sure, you could imagine that ha not having the right gut bacteria impairs that whole process. Sure. And there, there are all sorts of interesting correlations developing there that some of the same food agents that affect cancer, like the you know massive doses of antioxidants that are thought to prevent cancer, also affect the ratio of different groups of bacteria in the gut. Right. So right. there's, you know, there are these correlations that I would bet in another decade we're going to understand at a level that we can apply uh, clinically. Absolutely. So, you know, with all uh, apologies to Alio, I think this is, <laughs> I, I don't think we can do too much of this because as we go on, the mechanisms will be revealed and eventually, as you say, it's going to be translated into therapy. And, uh, you yeah. know, this is where microbiology is going in so many places to these complex stories where it's an entire community of organisms that's shaping either organ systems in the host or an environment in soil or water. And I, I don't think we can do enough of these because they're model systems for all sorts of other communities. Right, right. I'm glad you backed me up because otherwise Alia will yell at me. <laughs> well, he can yell at me, but I don't think you can ever do too much on the commensal bacteria. I, I agree, yeah. It's funny he would say that, but we'll do other things as well. But um, I, I thought a virus, this was just fascinating, you know, that, that it could do this. And this is going to get people thinking about probiotics. In fact, we do have an email about this. And uh, in fact, let's move to emails. And I will... See if I can find this one. I'm thinking. Yeah, let me read this one first. This is down the list. It's by Martin, who writes, "A couple of times you've mentioned probiotic 
bacteria foods. As an ignorant layman, I wonder if you know of any evidence that these work. If someone's intestine has been cleared by antibiotics, do these foods successfully deliver the right species to a pioneer territory where they will thrive and breed and establish a new ecosystem? And then he writes, your podcasts are a gift. Thank you for them. I'd recommend TWIP to anyone trying to diet. A TWIP is this week <laughs> in parasitism. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Martin is from Leeds. So, uh, Michael and Joe, is, is, do you know the answer to this question? The simple answer is infants. You know, if you feed infants the right yeah. mix, they, they do develop the right flora naturally. But I think he's asking the much tougher question. You're, you're never, unless you go to horrific efforts with radiation in concert with antibiotics, I don't think you can denude it to pioneer territory. I think there's always some flora left behind and you quickly recolonize. The question is how quickly you recolonize. And there have been studies in probiotics showing that, um, at least clinical trials, that uh, some of the probiotic yogurt products that are commercially available do indeed improve colonic health. Joe? Yeah, I, I think that it's not absolutely necessary to denude the entire gut of its flora in order to change the gut flora. And so the probiotics can change the ratio of different groups in the gut it can enhance the immune system by simply passing through. There's some evidence that some of these lactobacilli don't survive very well in the gut, but just on their way through, they incite an immune response that either directly or indirectly, maybe through the rest of the, the gut microbial community, um, that changes the response in all sorts of systemic ways. So, I, I think we can get effects of probiotics, and there's certainly plenty of evidence of effects of probiotics, without completely destroying the gut flora. And they do play a role in, in building back the flora in people who have been under heavy antibiotic treatment. Um, the, you know, the long, uh, long-standing approach to treating diarrhea associated with antibiotic use has been using probiotics, eating yogurt, and that, that has been proven to work. Okay. Our uh, next one is from Danina, who is a PhD candidate at Yale in the uh, Department of Environmental Engineering. And Danina writes, in TWIM number 12, a nurse practitioner posted an interesting question about the human skin microbiome, which received a trivia comment from Michael Schmidt, I believe. He mentioned that humans drop 2 million skin cells per hour. This is really amazing trivia information, and I would like to read more about it and learn about the background of the study which estimated this number. Would you be able to provide a title and author for this research so I could look it up? I went hunting. I went <laughs> hunting, and I, I racked my brain. This is one of these fun facts that you pick up talking to your colleagues in the hall, and I think I, was, uh, I, I, think I got the fact from a Durham textbook measuring skin and how the dermal layers slough off and how quickly they slough off based on the average rate that the dermal layers are growing and the keratinization mm -hmm. process. And unfortunately this week I, I was doing many other things. I saw the comment earlier this week and I meant to go to the library and get the derm textbook reference that I think I pulled it from. But that's where I got it from, from a, a derm textbook for dermatology. Okay. There's also a longstanding um, sort of uh, general rule that people leave about five pounds of skin in their mattresses every five years. So I don't I haven't done the calculation to figure out how much a sloughed off skin cell um, weighs. But if you imagine eight hours a night for 365 days a year for five years, that's about what you come up with five pounds of skin. <laughs> oh my gosh, five pounds. So that's a good reason to get rid of your mattress. Absolutely. Now and then. <laughs> or at least wash your sheets. <laughs> so now nobody will want to go to a hotel, right? Exactly, because you're not only sleeping on your own pounds of skin, but other people's as well. Oh gosh. 
Okay, that was really useful to find out. (laughs) Here on TWIM, you can learn all sorts of things. Okay, the next one is from Jim, who writes, TWIM 13 was outstanding. Listened to it two times, saved it to my best podcast folder. Is there not some way to harness the public, as is being done in astronomy, genomics, proteomics, and some music projects? Millions of us use all sorts of supplements, and while it's a sloppy process... If folks with technical expertise can tell us intelligent lab rats what to do and how to evaluate what we use or what to send in, (laughs) 10 million fecal samples come to mind. (laughs) I just thought of that. It might be an inexpensive postdoc project that some outfit like the American Dairy or American Goat Associations would help fund. Despite my lay status, old age, and lack of equipment, it occurs to me that I am a large bioprocessing complex with multiple sensors, access to a wide variety of reagents and variable environmental conditions, and a computer connected to the Internet. I'm not ready to shell out $500 to sequence my genome, but have no problem with $10 worth of drugstore items. Or what if a million of us kicked in $10 each to fund such a project? If not now, perhaps shortly a microarray or cell phone attachment will make such a project more feasible. People have always been a biological resource, but equipment and boundaries are shifting so that great new ways of using all this should be occurring. Somebody somewhere must be starting the bio equivalent of Radio Shack. Perhaps you know of projects like this, and if so, I would like to hear about them. (laughs) So he sends a link to a guy who made his own microscope incubator, and he said that link has links to similar projects in the do-it-yourself area. Your topics, your collaborator backgrounds and expertise, your collaboration in the process are amazing to hear, incredibly instructive and powerful. Just because the Fox Network and Rush Limbaugh haven't recognized you is such a blessing, too. But but I do hope you continue anyway. I'm some sort of geek because I live for this stuff. Regards, Jim is our friend from Virginia who listens to all of our podcasts. Okay, I think we will stop there and... uh, wrap up this episode of TWIM, if that's okay with you guys. It was fantastic. Yeah. TWIM, of course, can be found on iTunes, at the Zune Marketplace, or at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. You can also stream it to your iPhone or Android device. Uh, Microbe World has an app for that at microbeworld.org slash app. If you like TWIM, tell others about it, and do leave a comment over at iTunes. It helps keep us on the front page so that more people listen to us. We always love getting your questions and comments. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. Or you can go over to microworld.org slash twim and you can leave a comment there as well. Joe Handelsman is at Yale University. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Thanks, Vincent and Michael. It's been great being with you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Welcome back, Joe and Vincent. Thank you very much. (laughs) Pleasure to be back. I missed everyone. I missed doing TWIMS on Fridays. But you got to admit, Europe is a good draw. Yeah. And they they have lots of microbes in Europe, too. They do have lots of microbes and lots of people who study them as well, as you well know. Mm -hmm. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. TWIM is possible because of the support of the American Society for Microbiology, and particularly communications director Barbara Hyde, Chris Kandayan, and Ray Ortega, who helps us behind the scenes. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 